Welcome to season three, episode one of The Open Educator. The best place to be on a Tuesday morning. We are back for a great season this semester. We have wonderful guests, activists, creatives, and business gangsters. Thank you for joining us today for growing professionally and growing personally together. I would like to encourage everyone who has a camera to turn it on and to listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program is unique than any other program at USF, and it focuses on three main pillars. One, of course, we develop students to create their own business. And we will talk to a local entrepreneur today who's developed her own business. We have many alums as well uh, who are expanding their, their empire. But this is just one small view of entrepreneurship. The second pillar is we develop students to become innovators or entrepreneurial within a firm. We use their products, Apple, Amazon, Uber, you name it. There are individuals in these firms who are entrepreneurial, creating the next product and service. So you can work for a firm and manage these products, develop them and be creative and use the same skills we're learning in class. And I have, last time I counted, about 15 students between Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, et cetera. So you can work there as well. And lastly, we develop students to define careers. They define themselves, not what others define for them, like many of the other programs. And I have other students who are absolute influencers. And YouTube, IG, and influencers taking my classes from Bali. So what careers you have or what careers and dreams and desires you have, you can create them. And that's what the entrepreneurship program helps develop. And our next guest is someone who's making, uh, creating a path, a trailblazer, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for others to follow. She's deeply rooted in the Tampa Bay entrepreneurial scene. She is a board member of CASA, the Community Action Spouse Abuse Organization. And someone who's always supporting my organization or my classes, USF and the Tampa Bay community. Tampa Bay is lucky and grateful to have you here. She has walked in your shoes. She knows what it means to be an undergrad. She knows what it means to want to create your own path, maybe to start your own business, work for another company. And she's here to share her journey about creating her company and her firm. Our next guest will share these experiences leading and managing her startup. Please give a warm welcome to founder and CEO of Intrinio, Rachel Carpenter. Rachel, welcome. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Yes, that's correct. It's in sign language. This is clapping. This is what we do on the community. I love the jazz so, hand. Thanks, guys. That's right. um, <laughs> thank you for joining us this morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Absolutely. Man, we don't Man, have we don't time have... for this. Um, so I'll give you guys a quick overview of what I do, kind of how I got to where I am today. So I'm the founder and CEO of a financial technology company called Intrinio. Um, I originally grew up in Wisconsin. I was a musical theater major who decided to change to finance, which is very interesting. I use both sides of my brain a lot. Um, I double majored in finance and entrepreneurship. I taught myself how to program, and then my co-founder and I uh, started building our company almost eight years ago now. Um, what we do today, and it's had a lot of evolutions over time, a couple of pivots, and what it ended up being that we're really focused on today is using AI and machine learning to unlock financial data sets. So I know we have one accounting major on the call who may understand this, or maybe a finance major or two, but Data is the foundation of everything in financial services. In order to make investment decisions, you need to know what a stock is trading at, what the stock price is, how much revenue the company made, what, what is an analyst estimate on how much the company is worth. There's an unlimited amount of data points out there for analyzing investments and for kind of making capital markets work. But big companies like Bloomberg typically make that data very hard to get access to. So we set out to, to, to do a more automatic approach to the supply chain for that, those data sets. How can we go out and find those data sets, pull them in, clean them, and then put the data in the hands of innovators. So our end users of our data company are typically engineers, 
data scientists, quants. We sell to people who are, who are building something with the data. So a good example to understand the niche that, our, that my company plays in is something that's very familiar to everybody would be like a Yahoo Finance website where there's a ton of data. Yahoo Finance pays a large vendor $10 million a year for access to all the data points that you're looking at in that platform. What we would do is we would come in much more affordably and sell all the APIs that plug in those data points and we would be powering data into a platform like Yahoo Finance. So our users would be the developers working for Yahoo Finance that are building that web page. So mobile apps to help you look at the stock market might be powered by our data. AI investment bots, portfolio management software, all of these innovations that are taking financial services and moving it forward require data. And our goal is that it's all gonna be powered by Intrinio data one day and we're going to kind of be the plumbers that plug in the background. So there's been lots of twists and turns that have landed me here. Today, we are right in between raising our Series A and our Series B round. So I've raised almost $10 million in capital from investors. And I could probably talk for an hour just about fundraising. Um, and we've got about 30 employees. So it's been a journey to get to this point. I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes. I think I could probably write a book about all the mistakes that I've made. Um, so I love the opportunity to talk to classes like this because if I can help you guys understand something better so that you don't make the mistake or that you skip a few steps ahead in your journey, um, that's always fun for me to do. So excited to talk through entrepreneurial challenges, my journey, any questions you have. Um, it's gonna be fun. I'm excited to be here. We're grateful that you're here. Uh, there was something that you shared, and I think it's relevant to the audience because the audience is made up of students from all different majors. I have about 100 students in all my classes, and, and they're invited to this uh, open educator live session to build that community uh, instead of just to rely on ace or synchronous math technology or whatever that's not might not be appropriate for our, our class. But one thing that you mentioned was this idea that you uh, were a theory, theater major and you pivoted to a finance and maybe an entrepreneurship major. And my curiosity, because we have studio majors, we have animation majors, we have people from all over uh, the uh, from the university in different majors. How does, does your experience in theater help inform your business skills or your entrepreneurial skills or your innovation skills? And is there a connection? Oh, 100%. So I, as a CEO, I, one of my most important jobs is just being the face of the company, PR, speaking engagements, speeches, conferences, panels, things like that to kind of spread the word, thought leadership, get out there. That's acting, right? You're selling yourself. You're selling the company. You're promoting. You're trying to get your ideas out there and your thoughts about the industry. And so from a PR and marketing perspective, I use those skills every single day. I'm constantly having to inspire and motivate my team, which requires a lot of those skills. And pitching investors, it's a dance, right? It's a performance. You are performing in front of investors to try to convince them why you can take their money and make more money out of it. Um, and so not being afraid to speak in front of people, to pitch, um, those are all really important skills as a CEO. Um, regardless of what kind of company you have, if you're a contractor, if you're a designer, if you're um, an, an accountant, if you're whatever, you're selling your services, you're pitching, whether or not you're building a technology company or scaling a team, if you're being entrepreneurial in any sense of the word, you're gonna have to be pitching, presenting, speaking, telling your story. Um, and so I actually encourage people, if you don't have a major in musical theater, which most people don't, right? Um, go to Toastmasters, do, do some things like that because confidently telling your story is super important no matter what you're doing. Wonderful, I love that you plug Toastmasters and many of the other students know I've been a long time Toasty uh, for six years now. And I just actually this past week com competed in the humorous speech contest, but yes. I'm one happy that you shared that because the students who, think of it this, the students who are majoring in whatever, studio art, animation, in, in the art school, you are building these soft skills that help you if you choose to, your career path to build. At the same time, those who are maybe in the hard skills or more of the analytical business engineering, you may want to consider developing those skills if it's Toastmasters or, or whatever the case. So I'm super happy that you shared that. Yeah. Let's dive a little, little deeper into this area because many of my students have to 
create a lot of videos in my creativity and innovation class telling their stories about what they learned about creativity. And in the scalability class, they have to pitch five times and refine their story. Yeah. So we can see these connections. But one of the myths that we dispel is that this idea that creativity is tied to these arts. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, where does creativity play in your career or with your firm? Because we might not think of data being overly creative, but oh, yeah. where does it fall? Where, where does creativity fall in your industry and or, or your, the role within uh, that you manage? It's a great question. And I'm excited to answer it because I have so many smart people working for me that are wildly technical. My head of research, I have a PhD in machine learning. I mean, they are, they are would be traditionally labeled as the least creative people in the world. As you know, I know we have a computer science major, right? The stuff that they are building is so futuristic. Uh, that one of my one of my top engineers uses the phrase that he's constantly trying to figure out how to put a dent in the universe with the tech that he's building, right? Like that's the level that he's thinking at. My team is using natural language processing to build massive artificial neural networks that are essentially artificial human brains that are able to read any text and answer questions instantly, like an AI bot and create data sets. Like, how much more creative can you get than that? I mean, that's insane. That's thinking on a different plane of existence. That's like, let's make an artificial brain and build financial data sets out of it. I wouldn't have thought of that. That's my R&D team, right? And they're, they would be traditionally marked as not creative employees. And they, in terms of the ideation that they come up with for innovation, IP, bringing our products forward, sometimes they're more creative than my marketing team. I mean, arguably that's more creative than any marketing campaign that you could ever put out. And so I think it's super important and awesome that you guys are diving into that because we do need to challenge that notion of, of creativity. I have some incredibly creative, very technical people on my team. Wonderful example. I was happy that you threw out R&D because part of the scalability class, we go much deeper into what corporate innovation or what innovation is and how small, medium, large companies innovate. And as you guys can see who are taking the scalability or have taken the scalability, even the startup is using innovation to create new products or add on or build off of. So these are concepts that are very important and embedded in all uh, businesses or, or institutions. So wonderful. I know recently uh, you've, you've taken some training because you're on the board of CASA and it was about creativity. So think of it, think of this, uh, Rachel, CEO, Rachel, board of CASA, they're still encouraging training on creative problem solving. Can you share a bit about that and how it helped you, even with all of your experiences and all of your wisdom already? Why creative training? Or creative oh, training? I learned so much. It was one of the most impactful trainings I've had in a long time. And I, I do wear two hats, right? I'm running my startup, but I'm also on the board of this really important local nonprofit. Um, and the, the caliber of the, of the people on the board of CASA is incredible, right? I'm a fintech entrepreneur. There are IP attorneys and bankers and all kinds of local community members with decades of experience that are sitting on the CASA board. And we all had to go through this creative training together. And it was incredible. Essentially, the, the training was at the Dali Museum and we worked um, basically on understanding the creative process and where we fit along the creative process. So what types of cognitive profiles we use because to get things done at, at the nonprofit level and even at my startup, having a really good understanding of the way your brain works is one of the most powerful things that you can know, is know thyself, right? And so we went through this training to understand the creative process. There's clarification, ideation, development, and implementation. And when I started learning about these steps, what I learned about myself is that I am in really score high for ideation and implementation, meaning I'm a driver. I'm like, you got an idea? Let's do it right now. Put it, put it down, code it, get it out there. We're moving. I don't do so much of the clarification stuff in the beginning though. So much of the slow down, what's the target market? Have we written the metrics down? People like that piss me off, right? I'm like, get out of my way. But going through this training and understanding my creative tendency is to ideate and then move and implement, but developing it and making sure it's perfect or doing all the metrics in the beginning, like every single one of those stages in the creative process is super important. And that you can create a lot of conflict with your team members if you're trying to be creative 
when when I'm when I'm faced with a clarifier, my finance guy is a clarifier, and I want to just like push him out of the way. When but it's super important for him to slow me down to say, hang on, what what are we going to price this at? How many people are going to buy it? Does it make sense to build this? Should we really be rolling this feature out? You have to have a respect for people that are good at each stage of the creative process. So. My developers are obviously developers at the development stage, and they're like, give me extra time. It has to be perfect because they're developers. And I'm like, no, roll it out tomorrow. And so it was this like interesting kind of awakening that we all had as a board to recognize which board members are better at each stage of the creative process and how can we embrace each other, recognize which parts we're better at, and then you just build a basically a, a conveyor belt for innovation. But to slow down and actually understand who you are, what parts you're good at. I'm 31 years old and I've really scaled my startup and I didn't know any of this stuff. And neither did anyone on the CASA board. We went through this training, but it totally changed the way that we work together as a board to fight domestic violence. And it's changing the way that I, all of those skills that I brought back to my startup and the way that I operate as well. It was so much fun. Fascinating. And hopefully the students who are in my creativity and innovation class start seeing the parallels. Uh, the book that I wrote that they use, the workbook, has, has to cover the creative person, the creative environment, the creative process, which what you describe is a deeper dive. We're yeah. covering it at a higher level. And then the, the creative products and services. Mm -hmm. So we can start seeing if we don't have a, an understanding of ourselves, of our environment, of our process, and of our uh, products and services that are created, you know, we can't, it's difficult to just isolate one process. And we kind of do that in the creativity or in the scalability class if you choose to continue going on. So we can start seeing wonderful examples. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing that because these kind of bring home why we're learning and the value of the skills, the exercises, the books, and everything that we're learning. It's not school, it's relevant and very relevant. And these are wonderful examples that Rachel has put forth. And you're never, too young or too old to rediscover no. your creative self. I'm jealous. I wish I would have learned this stuff when I was still in school. You guys have a leg up on, I mean, I'm talking about these board members and these board members on CASA are in like their forties and fifties and they're learning this stuff for the first time. So you guys are, you're lucky to be learning this. It's gonna, it's gonna be awesome for you. I would like to pivot a bit to your progress in scaling your organization. Has there been any challenges when scaling I know many of my students are in my scalability class and we talk about scaling, but what challenges have you faced and how did you overcome them? You know, I read about all of this stuff in my entrepreneurship program and you think you're going to be ready for it and you know it's all coming and then it just punches you in the face. <laughs> um, and it's so different in practice when you have so many distractions around you and you know you're getting to the point where you're about to scale and everything's going to break and you are not ready for it. <laughs> um, that's honestly why it's so critical to have such a good team around you to help you get through those turning points as a business. But we we reached our series A level of a company pretty organically. And there's a lot of people I talked to in the industry who are really jealous of the fact that we had a really strong inbound customer acquisition engine. So we didn't do, I mean, I have like a two person marketing team. We had no real salespeople for years because we had a content, we call that content net, like a content engine of SEO and PPC and blogging and keywords and on site and off site, all of the stuff that really technical users that wanted data just found us. They came to our website, they filled out a form, and we just had leads coming in like hot potatoes. And it felt great. And we scaled up to the Series A point, and then we started to plateau a little bit. And we said, wait a minute, what got us from A to B is really exciting. And it's, and then you get all this praise from people saying, oh, I wish we had an inbound engine that worked as good as yours does. And you realize it's not going to be the thing that gets you to the next level and to really start hockey sticking and growing. And we are going through that right now. Like I have meetings on this today. So it's very applicable. Um, it comes down to, do you have the right people that can get you to the next level? Do you have the right leadership that can get you to the next level? Like the right processes, the right systems, the, you know, scalable systems. We don't necessarily have all that stuff figured out yet. And so we're hiring for the first time outbound salespeople. And outbound sales is a doggy dog world. I mean, it is totally different from the type of customer acquisition that we've done before, even culturally. It's interesting because we're hiring people that are really hungry and aggressive um, and trying to make it all fit and work together. So those are just a couple of the challenges we're facing, but we're having to think through 
How does our sales process have to evolve? How do we have to acquire customers in a different way? Does this change our messaging at all? Do we need to hire different people, shift people around in the business? I would say another really interesting thing that I realized is that we didn't have a product team. And this is an interesting concept because there's a million different ways that you can structure your company and have your org chart and your teams. And a lot of people think of product as technology, but we think about that very differently. I have a CTO and a bunch of engineers who, when we tell them what to build, they get it done. But that middle ground in between technology and marketing and sales in terms of thinking through the product roadmap with the context of what are our customers asking for? What's the feedback loop there? What is the market demanding? What are the opportunities? And how does our product map need to evolve? CTOs aren't really the ones to do that, but neither are salespeople. And so we're designing for the first time ever this product team to sit in the middle of the organization and say, based on real data coming from our customers and coming from the industry, how does our company and our product need to evolve? That was a piece we were missing, right? We would have salespeople saying, oh man, I almost closed that $50,000 deal, but we were missing that one data point. And my CTO would say, I could have done that in 20 minutes and you could have closed that deal. And that, that feedback loop, like there are so many tiny little things like that that can break and, and you leave so much on the table when you don't have some of those things figured out. So that's just a random sampling of all the things that we're dealing with right now. Um, when you have a smart team, you can figure it out, but it requires you to kind of slow down a little bit um, and rethink out, out your systems. One thing that I try to push the students to think is having this um, forward thinking uh, vision of where their project's going because they're trying to innovate on a local problem. And what I hear you saying is you, as a CEO, there, of course, there's things breaking currently in the present, but you know you need to get to whatever C over there, but you are thinking of B even if A isn't fixed yet. So you are working in almost this multiple reality setting which I hope believe that the creative problem solving will help helps in juggling these different, uh, you know, futures is really what it is. And so it, it takes a, an, an immense amount of power to think, you know, beyond the reality that currently exists. Right. So um, yeah. um, that's what I'm hearing from you. So hopefully when I'm trying to connect to the, the projects, you know, you, you, you know, you're in this situation, but, in order to get into the fire situation, there's an intermediate step and you have mm -hmm. to be thinking what you need at, at that step, which is what I hear, yeah. hear you say. One thing I'd love to just add on really quick to that is just to, the, I would say there's a caveat to that, which is that there are times in which you have to do things that don't scale to get you to the next level. And so a good example of this is, I don't know if anybody here has heard of 1 million cups. It's like a local, the greenhouse does it. Before I knew how to pitch, I don't know what I was doing. I was like, how do I explain my company to people? Will they understand it? I've got to ask investors for money. That was the perfect place for me. I could get feedback from people. Maybe I'd meet a local angel investor that could massively move the needle for me. At that point in time, that type of marketing isn't scalable. There's only one of me, right? Like in the future, that kind of stuff doesn't move the needle for me, right? Like one local angel investor, I've, I'm working with VCs now. I'm on a different level. That doesn't, it's not scalable, doesn't work for me. At the time, it was the best thing for me to get to the next level. If you're comfortable pivoting around it, knowing that it's not going to scale, you're going to need to move on to different type of activities after that, then it works for you. But there are times at which you have to do things knowing they won't scale, but knowing that they're going to help you get to the next level. That makes sense. I refer to scaling a solution to an, an unscalable problem because you can come up and package your, your pitch in various ways. Right. And now that can be repeated overly successful, but the, the problem isn't scalable. Yes. Wonderful. Exactly. You mentioned things breaking. I'd imagine that's also tied to fears. What fears have you uh, faced as an entrepreneur and how did you get over them? And are they real? Are fears real as an entrepreneur or an <laughs> innovator? That's the more important question is, are they real? Because yes, you're going to have them. I'm constantly scared of different things and have to, you know, you almost feel like your energy getting to a point where you're like, all right, I force myself to sit down. I'm like, what are you afraid of right now, Rachel? And I actually write it out and I do what you just said. I physically write out, what are all the things that are bothering me? Like Armageddon scenario, all the things that could go wrong, right? And then you go through them one by one. And you have to ask yourself, is it actually real, right? Is this a real fear. And then once you eliminate those out of the way, you can do another swipe of things like, does it matter? Right? So of course there's all these fears when you, when you put yourself out there as an entrepreneur that you might fail. Right. And, and that's 
serious because I've taken millions of dollars from investors. I employ 30 people who have families who, if we tank or we fold, that impacts children, it impacts families, it impacts my investors who believed in me, you know, all the naysayers who said I couldn't do it, right? It's like you always have this kind of idea of this fear of failure. That's the one that doesn't matter though, because that's so much more involved with what other people think. And, and, and realizing that that doesn't matter at all. And so the more you go on, the more you do this practice of starting to feel like something's wrong, write it down, is it real? That actual practice of physically writing it down makes a big difference. But yeah, I mean, there are times when we're, we have only months of cash left in the bank or a, a competitor emerges and you immediately turn into a panic. Um, you know, those kinds of things can happen all the time. And I would say that it's constant. So it's not, I mean, certain people are more easily afraid than others. I mean, it just depends on your personality profile. No matter who you are, though, like if you're embarking on entrepreneurship, you have to be brave. It's a super, you have to be brave. It doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It just means that you move on and forward regardless of what you're afraid of. And so I think having that resilience and that bravery to break through the times when you're afraid um, is what matters the most because you're going to be afraid no matter what. Right. And if you think that you're not, you're just lying to yourself. So, um, just being resilient, being brave through it and, and writing things down. Um, just as he said, you know, is it real? Does it matter? And shake it off. That's what's usually works for me. Wonderful. Let's incorporate that because I think those are good life lessons to the fears we have for giving a presentation, the fears of doing our homework, the fears of interviewing or for an internship or for a job. And that's kind of where my next question is. But before I offer, I would like to uh, plant a seed in all the students. We will have a Q&A time uh, for within this hour. And so start thinking about the questions you have for Rachel or on any topic, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them. So I'm placing that seed out there. Let's water it. But we talked about this idea of um, fears and then maybe the fear of interviewing. But these interviews, or internships and jobs can help us in the future. And you have a wonderful story about your experience of an internship has influenced your leadership and management style. Would you be willing to share that with the group? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story and very painful. Um, so my only kind of real job before I started my business, because I've been doing my business since I was in college, I had a student assistant job. It was like you know, hourly student job at a local software firm. I was in the benefits HR department and part of my job was to put healthcare, health insurance information into envelopes for the employees and mail them. So pretty soul crushing work to be putting paper in envelopes all day long. And we ran out of stamps one day and I thought, well, we'll be actually violating some of the laws if we don't get this health insurance information out on time. And so I'm just going to take a stamp that's like a dollar, a big stamp, and put it on to make sure I get all of these out. And I got called into my boss's office a couple of days later, and she had every single envelope laid across her desk. And she said, do you see a problem here? And I was like, are you talking about the one stamp that's different? And she said, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big uh, lack of attention to detail, I would say. And I was like, thought it was actually more critical to get them out on time. It's like a 50 cent oversight. And she was like, yeah, you're probably not gonna have a good chance of getting a full-time job here when you graduate if you continue to, to make mistakes like this. And I was floored. I didn't even know what to say. I was actually that day that I went back to school and added the entrepreneurship major on top of finance because I said to myself, I could, A, I could just never work for somebody again. This is outrageous. And B, I want the opportunity to be a better boss than that. Like I want, I don't ever, I want to have employees. And I don't ever want to treat them that way. And so it was painful, but, but I do have to kind of thank that experience for being the thing that was like this moment where I realized I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be better than that. And that set me on the path that I'm on today and really informed a lot of my leadership style. When I'm interviewing people, I always tell them, I say, I hire super smart people and I get out of their way, right? If that woman had just gotten out of my way, things would have been fine, right? And so I say to these people, I'm hiring you because you are the expert in your lane and I want you to tell me what to do. If I'm hiring you on the marketing team, it means you know more about marketing than I do. 
I'm hiring you on the engineering team. You know more about computer science than I do. And so we have this culture and I have this leadership style that, that trickles down through everybody of kind of equal opportunity across the firm where people see things at different corners of the business that it's impossible for me to see. And if I'm not listening to them and if I'm micromanaging them, it's going to just slow everything down across the entire business. And so it was a pretty horrible experience that actually set me on a path and shaped the kind of leader I am today. Thank you for sharing that and being vulnerable because I could imagine that didn't feel good after the manager reprimanded over the 50 cent stamp. Yeah. And what I want, what I, what I want to highlight with the, for the students, regardless if you end up running your own business or you choose to go in an organization, there is no law that says the management of the past has to be the management of the future. The way that business is done, if we believe business has changed and we believe technology has changed, then we have to believe that management also needs to change. And basically, you guys are at the forefront, the war between management and organizational culture of the past and what is possible in the future. And from Rachel's example is, do we want to live in, a, in an organization, in an environment that doesn't acknowledge the real problem solving, in fact, what she was trying to do, solve the problem, get it out and abide by the law and give people a, a voice? Or do we want this top down management command and control, which dates back to World War II in the military? Where the manager knows best, they're going and we become an extension of the organization or an extension of the machine. And I'm asking and challenging all of you. To choose the latter being you can redefine what management is, what organizational culture is, and what leadership styles you have. And they do not have to resemble management of the past or, frankly, most of the manner leadership styles that are we're taught in, in management class. There will be new ones, new framing, new mashups, new rearrangements. But it's our obligation to make sure that we are at the forefront to make that change. It's not inevitable that or law that defines that we have to have this top down micromanagement inhumane type of organization. So we are playing an active role as we join these organizations and become leaders and managers. And maybe we're doing that already. Again, this is your time to ask questions. Uh, I have, of course, I have a few more for Rachel. Does anyone want to raise their hand and be courageous and put that fear behind them? I see one person raise their hand. Chad, wonderful. Please take the floor, Chad. Um, currently, I'm in uh, Professor Bolzer's uh, team and group dynamics class. And um, he's uh, running, he, we have a team project in his class. And currently, I have a problem. And I was wondering if uh, your guest could help. Right now, we're we're trying to start an organization or community on campus where that is trying to abolish uh, human trafficking. But uh, we're just now getting started, and we don't. We're looking for uh, students on campus that are that would be committed to you know being on the board and running, helping run this organization. And uh, my problem is reaching these people because. I'm taking an entrepreneurial mindset to approach this, and I'm looking for my target market is, uh, you know, people that are committed to abolishing human trafficking. But um, it's difficult to reach them on campus right now. Yeah. And we can't use uh, the USF platform yet until we have a board to establish the organization. So I'm just wondering if uh, Rachel had any advice as to like reaching people like you know they're out there in the community but you don't yeah. how to know how to connect with them yeah that's a great question and it sounds like a situation in which you got to figure out how to be creative right so it's a good thing we're and i have the same exact problem because i'm on the board of casa we have to constantly think about who are the right people to join the board that we know can help us and finding them is hard right i mean i i, I have the same challenge but probably not even as hard of a challenge as you because you're within you want to hire students right you want students to be involved yeah but my, I, would, I would just have questions for you. It would be, well, where are students congregating digitally right now? Because if they're not physically congregating, where are they congregating digitally? Are there Facebook groups? Are there LinkedIn groups? Are there chats? Is there a Discord or a Slack community? Where are students gathering that you can actually get in front of them? 
Um, Cause I'd imagine they're also spread out. A lot of them are probably not even in physically in the, the city of St. Pete. Is that probably true? Is that true? Yeah. There's multiple campuses like Tampa, Sarasota and St. Pete. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I would say you have to figure out how to gain a digital audience with them. And you just have to figure out, you know, get in the heads of students, maybe ask your classmates here, right? Where, where would I find you guys do a survey? of people that you actually, so you, you do have a small sample size of people that you do have direct access to, which is your classmates. So how can you use them to survey them and say, where do you guys hang out online? How, how would I get in front of you if I wanted one of you to be on the board? So I would survey a small sample size that you do have access to and do some brainstorming around where you can digitally connect with them. That's where I would start. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Great, Chip. So I saw, uh, and I don't know which order, but we'll say, uh, Lauren, Jerry, and Piero, why don't you guys go? Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chad. Um, my question was it kind of similar, but it's how did you go about advertising your personal business? Like when you first um, like started it and how did you go about like um, advertising it to people? Did you use social media? Did you use television? What was your... So the first thing when you're developing that strategy is to really clearly define who your target market is. So for us, social didn't make a lot of sense because our target market were like banks and asset managers and data scientists and quants. And so understanding who that is and, and very similar to Chad, where do they live, right? What are, what are the mediums and the platforms that you can get in front of them at? What we quickly realized about the behavior of the people that we were trying to promote and advertise to is that they're developers, right? They just want to go on the internet and search and find what they're looking for. And if they're just going to Google, we're looking for financial data, then we sure as heck better have a really strong SEO strategy because that's all the keywords is how they're going to find your website, right? I would say that that though is a given no matter what your business is, is having, you know, do some basic courses on SEO. Um, I know I think you might've said you're a marketing manager or a marketing major, so you might be doing some of this already, but I do truly think that the one marketing medium that is universal is SEO having a blog, having content, being really smart about your keyword strategy, the types of words that you're using on your website, um, researching your customers, figuring out, you know, A-B testing, what words resonate with them. So SEO as a foundation of really get a solid understanding of that, a, a website with great content, pushing thought leadership out there. And then I don't know, it was very dependent on what your target market is, but doing the research to figure that out. For us, it was um, you know, data science competitions, fintech incubators. There were different places that we could get. We partnered with a hedge fund and did a global data science competition and gave our data away for free, right? Just to get out, you know, hundreds of data scientists got exposure to us. So being creative, unique partnerships like that. But I would say SEO, content, keywords, website as a base, and then really figuring out who your target market is would inform the right routes to take. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And you probably need to do multi uh, multiple. Uh, steps at the same time potentially yeah so it's not they're not exclusive and they're not linear yep uh jerry the floor is yours please thank you lauren all right thank you i have a question about the conception of intrinio i know you said you mentioned that um you provide apis to um banks and asset managers mm -hmm. at a marketably lower price than your competitor how did you come up with that idea did you just notice that there was a gap in the market for that service or was it more kind of you're experimenting with your um, financial expertise and your programming expertise and then you saw that you could take this somewhere? Both actually. So uh, my co-founder and I, we, it was a massive pivot. Originally what we were trying to build was an app where you could type in a stock ticker and it would tell you whether to buy or sell the stock, like a, an investing tool, like a website. But to do an analysis like that, should I buy or sell? Is this a good investment opportunity? You need so much data that we were, we spent a year building that platform and we were illegally screen scraping data from 10,000 websites. So like scraping Yahoo Finance for data points and violating their terms of service because little did we know they were actually paying millions of dollars a year for that data. Um, and so the analogy that I always use, it's the perfect way to understand is that we were trying to build a car. We couldn't afford to put gas inside of it. We got quoted $80,000 a month for data. And so we were actually trying to build, build the app, couldn't afford the data, decided, shoot, maybe we should be in the gas industry. Maybe we can John Rockefeller this thing and actually be the plumbing in the back end um, and put gas in everybody's car instead. And so that was the major pivot that actually landed us in our business was 
literally wasting a year of my life, right? Like building this app that went nowhere. But the anger that fueled me saying, okay, now I want to make this accessible to everybody. I want to power all of these apps that people are going to build. That was like the fuel that kind of pivoted us around that corner and made us realize if this is a, if this is super inflexible, super expensive, and not like there's not really good developer tools, like no APIs, that's the future of finance. Everything's becoming more technical. We can fit, we can solve that problem for that niche. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Piero, the floor is yours. Hi, Rachel. So um, my question is, I, um, what are your key points for fundraising? And my other question is, how can we still be connected to you? Great questions. Um, so fundraising, I'm going to send um, I'm going to send you guys a link afterwards. I'll make sure it gets to you of an article I wrote for Forbes where I just wrote down like all the things I did wrong in fundraising and then like a, a list of like do this, don't do that, quick tips and tricks, right? Like you can spend all day toiling over making the perfect pitch deck. And I guarantee you that you will never have a meeting where somebody like goes through your pitch deck slide by slide. Just like things like that, that could save you a lot of time. Um, I would say, don't be geographically constrained. You don't have to raise money in Florida. Um, I tried to do that for a long time. And then I got investors in New York and Singapore. Got to go eat crab legs on the Singapore shore and get some investors. Um, so don't be geographically constrained. Be super, super passionate and clear about what you're doing. Um, have a financial narrative. It's the least fun part for most people, but not just having financials, but a financial narrative is really important. Um, how do you weave in your business story with financials and show how things are going to scale over time? There's a lot of research out there on financial narrative. It's often overlooked. That's where people get stopped when investors start asking them questions. Um, my co-founder was a CPA, so we were very lucky in that department. Um, so the financial narrative is often overlooked. People feel constrained geographically. They spend too much time on the pitch deck. Um, and they don't realize that it's a marriage. You should be asking just as many questions to the investor as they're asking to you. How much money do they have in their fund? How many investments do they make every year? What kind of profile do they look for? Do they reinvest? Do they, do they save capital to keep investing over time? There's a whole host of questions. You have to like them. They're going to be in your business. They might be on your board. They're going to be asking you questions. They're part of your team essentially at that point in time. And so there's not a lot of reverse interviewing. That's another point. But there's probably a dozen other things that I'll share the article so you guys can see all my tips and tricks there. Um, and in terms of connecting with me, um, I'll give uh, my email out so you guys can shoot me emails. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So either of those would work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being so generous, Rachel. Uh, yeah. I know you're busy and. And this is also a very warm welcome to anyone who wants to build their network, learn from those who've walked before, uh, follow the trail of breadcrumbs to follow. So this is a very generous offer and we, we thank you for that. Of course. Before we move on, any last questions from the audience? Of course, you can reach out to Rachel. She generously offered an uh, opportunity to, to talk further. So well, I also want to respect your time. A few last questions. Right now, we idolize a lot of these entrepreneurs, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs. Um, they can't do anything wrong. What is unsexy about entrepreneurship and innovation or what needs to be said that isn't said? Ooh, it's not for everyone. I think it's become very popularized, right? But it's not for everybody. It's really hard. It's and the emotional roller coaster of failures, being on the brink of dying and running out of cash, the amount of times that you hear the word no is can just be absolutely demoralizing. And to have the if you don't choose something that you're really passionate about, you will not get through that it will be so discouraging and you won't care enough to deal with, with all of that. And so really following your passion. I know it's corny and people say, if you do what you're passionate about, like you won't feel like you're working, but it's so true, right? That's caring about what you're doing is the only thing that will get you the, the degree of resiliency you need to get through all of the hard parts of entrepreneurship. And so if you aren't the kind of person that wants to be uncomfortable, a lot of, we, we need people like that, right? Like we need people to work all kinds of jobs. And so if, if you're if you don't want to be uncomfortable, entrepreneurship's not for you. If you aren't passionate about what you're doing, it's not for you. If you're not resilient and you don't have grit and you're willing to to take on the hard days, right? That, then it's not for you. And so I think it's become very popular to be an entrepreneur. Um, 
you really got to do a self-assessment and recognize if you're if you're prepared to get through it. Risk is reward, right? I mean, the, the, the caveat to that is I learned probably 20 times the amount I learned in school in one year of building my business. I mean, you grow so fast just by necessity. Googling, having to figure things out, you will be a different person when you get through it and a better person when you get through it. You just got to really make sure it's it's for you. So it's worth it. I love it. Um, but it's, I think not a lot of people say that, you know, it, it really isn't for everybody and it is unsexy. I slept on a lazy boy couch for a year. I, with no income, negative income coming out of college, my co-founder was putting food on the table and I was sleeping on a couch teaching myself how to program. I stayed in bunk bed hostels in Chinatown in New York city, trying to get people to give me money. Um, I overworked myself to the point where I got viral meningitis, ended up in the hospital after a conference in New York city because my immune system was so suppressed, right? Like that's the ugly side of it. Like you can overwork yourself. It can be really exhausting. Um, so taking care of yourself is super, super important as well. Um, so not to scare you guys, because I do want to encourage you to be entrepreneurs, but it isn't sexy a lot of the time. Um, so that's, that's just kind of a, a sprinkling of thoughts, but it's not sexy, but it's so, so rewarding and it, it is life-changing. You become a totally different person. It truly is a journey. And from your, your comments really shows that it's a journey ups and downs ins and outs and this very visceral uh, image that we now have <laughs> maybe it hel helps us reassess our wants, our desires and what fortitudes, uh, what, what desires we have and, and the, do we have the fortitude to choose what we're passionate about and then to, to continue down that path. Yeah. I, I think we could talk for hours. I also want to be respect respectful. You, you mentioned um, it's not for everyone. I introduced a framework called VUCA. And VUCA is this kind of concept that um, deals with entrepreneurship or the kind of the state of, of where organizations are dealing with, you have to be comfortable with dealing with volunteer, um, vo volatility, uh, uncertainty, uh, complexity, and ambiguity. And that's something that we try to develop within the entrepreneurship program, the idea that people feel comfortable with these things, because ultimately, as you shared, nothing's stable, nothing goes as planned. And... Um, there, you could things can go sideways, as, as yeah. you mentioned. The other day we talked about frameworks, and this I think really needs to be said. We talk, we use frameworks to help us understand, you know, the complexity or to make the complex simple. However, there's also limitations to these frameworks, particularly for entrepreneurship. What view do you have of these? Of any of them, if if you want to pick one of these limitations, maybe the startup or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and what are your thoughts about these frameworks? Do they help? Do they not? Are there limitations or what? They help. There's limitations. There's one piece of a particular methodology that bugs me. I'm sure you guys have learned about the lean startup methodology, which is essentially find a problem and solve it, which is important. We have an inordinate amount of problems that need to be solved in our society. Um, and so it's, you know, it's this concept of, well, did you ask your customers? Did you interview your customers? Did you ask them what they wanted? Did you really vet out the problem statement and the solution? Like very lean startup-y kind of a framework. And that's very important. But I think about entrepreneurship and business and innovation in, th in kind of three chunks. There's that base level of kind, and it's super important, right? Like how do we solve our everyday problems? Trinkets and apps and things that can, you know, you interview a customer, this could make your life better. This can solve a problem, fill a gap. And those are great, right? And that follows the Lean Startup methodology. You're solving a problem. The second bucket to me is these bigger, like, you could, you could argue that they aren't part of the Lean Startup, but to me, they're still solving problems. Um, you think about like the Google Moonshot factory where they're, they're, you know, internal corporate innovation, they're working on like changing agriculture, stopping global warming, like all of these huge projects that are innovative and entrepreneurial. And they seem to be in a different category. They're moonshots, right? They're like these big picture things that we need brilliant minds working on that are at a different level, but those are still just solving problems that already exist in front of us. To me, there is this third category of the future that not a single person that you would interview about their problems would even be able to see today, right? Like the next level that society is going to, which we can't even see. And a good example of this is like everyone during the industrial revolution was terrified, right? They're like, what are these, what are these machines going to do? What, what are jobs going to look like in the future? And we were so scared because how could we have predicted the computer? 
No one could have predicted that. There was no problem to solve that we needed a computer for. And there was this whole new world that got opened up because there were people thinking out of the box about things like that. Now we're going, oh my God, robots are gonna take away our jobs, AI, what's gonna happen? And who are the people that are thinking about that next step? It's that big of a leap, right? And it's so impossible to even wrap your head around it because we can only see what's in front of us right now, right? We, there's, we can't even imagine what that next step is gonna look like. I read this stat the other day that was like, there's technically these like certain levels for organizational or uh, like, like the human race, like our world, basically like what level are we at as a, as a society? And like a level two would mean that we are like harnessing energy from the nearest star in our solar system. We're not even we're freaking close to that, right? We're like a level one society. So like who is thinking about things like that, right? And so like you get, you'll, you might get a professor or somebody saying, no, what problem are you solving? You're not following the lean startup methodology. And it's like, yes, that's important. We need to be building trinkets and apps and solving everyday problems. We need to be solving existing problems like global warming, but we also need to be thinking about what the future looks like. And nobody that you interview about their problems is gonna provide good data for that. And so I just don't think it gets talked about enough. I'm kind of passionate about that. It's not like I'm working on anything like that right now, but I think somebody should. Um, and I think it's important. I don't think we should discourage people from thinking about that and force them into a framework. So my thoughts on that. Wonderful. We may call this uh, exponential thinking or, you know, we, we probably in our society call people crazy who think about, <laughs> yeah. hard, you know, so what Rachel's sharing is we may know some things about starting a business or a startup but not everything falls in that bucket. And if we only look at what we see or what we know, then we're missing out how to change climate, you know, fix climate change or provide access to clean drinking water to everyone. And then there's something beyond that because if we even reach that category, there's a whole other problems that exist at a higher level and we need to be solving them at another exponential level, which is the example that, that Rachel gave. So, how do we as a society, as friends, as open educators support this type of, build a community that accepts this type of thinking? No one thought about the computer. No one thought about Sir Isaac Newton and you know these different laws or gravity, right? Or Copernicus and all these other things. So the idea of, we assume the world was flat. So you know we need to think beyond the world is flat and we are only thinking the worlds are flat based off of the, frameworks and the dogmatic conversations that we're having uh, that dominate what entrepreneurship, what innovation is, what are the best practices. They work for some, but maybe not for if the world isn't flat anymore. I have, I think we can go list after list with questions, but I always ask my guests one final question because uh, we want to be respectful of your time and I'm grateful that you shared it with us this morning. If you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give her? Hmm. I would have to say there's two things top of mind for me on this one. The first is that the roller coaster always goes back up again. Um, because to that point earlier, we talked about fears, we talked about discouragement, we talked about getting meningitis and ending up in the hospital, right? Like the resilience of like just telling myself at the every time I hit the bottom of the roller coaster, like it does go back up again. Like you've got this. I, I worked through it. Obviously, I'm still here today, but just you know, having that understanding of of the fact that it's gonna go back up again, I think would have made a lot of that easier for me. Um, I didn't have a lot of this stuff available to me and other entrepreneurs to talk through with it. So that would have been nice. Um, and then in addition to that, I would say say no more often. We're guilty of this at Intrinio a lot. There's shiny pennies everywhere. People that want to partner with you. I want this kind of data. I want that. Or maybe I could be a user. Come, come do this. And if you don't stay laser, laser focused on the one thing that moves the needle and keep it very simple, um, you're, you're going to get distracted. You're going to fail. You're going to slow down. I saw a stat recently. Um, there's a company called Figma. It's a really cool kind of prototyping graphic design interface that we use to design our website. They didn't build a second product until they had 200 salespeople on their team because they were scaling their first product so well. And so like, that's a scale 
thing, right? Like only do one thing until you've got it scaling, you've got it working. We've added on data sets and done all kinds of things. Um, and those are some lessons that I've learned. So staying really focused and saying no to things that are really exciting to you is so hard. Like it's easy to sit here and say, well, I would have said no. And it's really hard to do it. And it's, it's a practice you have to get into to stay laser focused. So I think that makes all the difference, especially in the early stages when you're getting started. That would have been nice to have that mindset early on. Wonderful. I think that is uh, challenging. Before we say goodbye to Rachel, I would like to, we have another guest. And Jeffrey, would you like to share just a few words about what uh, services and, and how you can help the students that are on this call? Gosh, Steve, yeah, I'd be glad to. I didn't realize I was going to get a chance, but uh, no, we are the Undergraduate Programs Office in the K. Tiedemann School of Business and Finance, and we're embedded in Lynn Pippinger Hall, and we will help students with career advising, internships, uh, some tutoring if necessary, those sorts of things. If you have career questions, resumes, interviewing, uh, trying to find the right roles for you out there, trying to find the right companies, we are here to serve you. So thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. And sure. Rachel, great thank job. Thank you for doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. And so students, we are not alone. We have a support network. This is why Rachel comes. This is why Jeffrey has a team. You are not alone in this journey and we have fears and these are ways to get over our fears, to learn, to grow, uh, to think exponentially, to create the career, the life, the dreams that we have and to follow them. So Rachel, I could not be more grateful for the hour that you spent with us. Uh, let's check in again soon, yep. uh, maybe have you back, but um, we're grateful. Thank you again for imparting some wisdom and inspiring us uh, to live a more fuller life and, and you know, follow our passions and to, to grow personally and professionally. So thank you. Of course, thanks for having me. You guys ask great questions. You're a bright group. I'm sure that you guys are gonna impress the heck out of all of us. So I'll make sure that my contact information is out there so I can stay connected to everybody. This has been fun, thank you. Let's give Rachel a big round of applause, even if our mics are off. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you later. Anyone who wants to stay in, I'm happy to answer any questions for our classes. Wonderful. Really proud of you guys with those questions. Really proud of you guys. Uh, if you guys you guys are happy to stay on, if you have questions, really proud of you guys for coming. Next, I forgot to tell you, we're having our next uh, talk on 10-12. Forgot to tell you that. And um, we'll see you then. Any questions you might have? Let me stop the video. Uh,